Welcome to Lesson 11e, Introduction to Computational Fluid Dynamics. In this lesson, I introduce Computational Fluid Dynamics, CFD, and I'll show a procedure for how to apply it. Then I'll show several examples of CFD solutions. As a quick introduction, let's review the equations of fluid flow. We have one scalar equation for continuity and three components of the Navier-Stokes equation. For a 3D flow, this represents three more equations. So we have four equations and four unknowns, the three velocity components, and pressure. If this were compressible, we'd also have to solve for density. How do we solve this set of equations? We have three basic choices. We can solve these equations analytically and exactly, but this is limited to simple flow geometries, as we've been showing in previous lessons, fully developed pipe flow, coet flow, an oil film falling down a vertical wall. The equations get too hard or impossible to solve for complicated geometries, so this technique is limited. We can solve approximately by eliminating some terms in the Navier-Stokes equation. This makes the equations easier, but we have to be careful because the approximations may not be valid. For example, we can ignore the viscous terms in the Navier-Stokes equation. But for flow near walls, this term turns out to be very important. I'll discuss approximate solutions in more detail in the next set of lessons. The third way is to solve numerically using computer software. Here we keep all the terms in the Navier-Stokes equations. Then we can solve for any geometry, but we need to do it properly. Otherwise, we get the wrong solution. This is what we'll talk about in this lesson, computational fluid dynamics, or CFD. Now I'll show you the general procedure for CFD solutions. The procedure is similar to what we did for analytical solutions, but there are some differences. Step one is to choose a computational domain and generate a mesh, also called a grid. As a simple example, suppose you have flow over a rectangular block. Your computational domain would be this region, and you split the domain into cells, and these do not have to be the same size but they fill up your entire domain. An actual mesh that you generate for CFD would have thousands of cells. There are various types of meshes. This would be an example of a structured mesh. In a structured mesh, you can identify a cell by some indices, here i and j. This is the cell that has i equal 4 and j equal 3. You can also have an unstructured mesh. Here are two examples. These are all in two dimensions, by the way. This is an unstructured triangular grid where some cell can be identified, but not with indices like we did here. You can also have an unstructured quadrilateral grid where these cells are quadrilaterals, four-sided instead of three-sided. If we look at one of these cells, this is the fourth cell from here, but it's only the third cell to this row, so you cannot define the cell by indices. You can also have polygons in an unstructured mesh. This particular case is called a hybrid grid because it has a structured mesh near the wall and then polygons outside the wall region. This is pretty typical because of thin boundary layers near the wall. This is an unstructured polygonal grid or mesh in 2D. The 3D analog is polyhedrals and they can have any number of edges or sides. For any of these cell types, we must avoid large skewness. A triangular cell like this has low skewness, whereas one like this has high skewness. This is good for CFD. This is not. This sharp angle can lead to numerical issues and inaccuracies. Step two is to specify boundary conditions on each edge for 2D flow or face for 3D flow on the boundary of the computational domain. Again, for our simple example of flow over a rectangular block, we would specify a wall boundary condition here, here, and here. We specify some constant speed at the inlet. The terminology may vary between different CFD programs, but this is typically called a velocity inlet. This upper boundary could be a wall or a symmetry plane, meaning that everything above it is symmetric across that surface. If this were a block along a wall, you would specify wall boundary conditions here too. If you specify symmetry, everything becomes a mirror image across that symmetry plane, including the velocity inlet and this boundary. Now we're modeling flow over a block in a free stream.
At this boundary, we may specify a pressure outlet where we set the pressure to some value, or outflow where the derivatives of all the variables with respect to this direction, normal to the boundary, go to zero. You can also specify a periodic boundary condition. Suppose we're modeling flow over an array of these rectangular blocks. We can choose our flow domain as this, with a velocity inlet and a pressure outlet, but we choose these two boundaries as a periodic pair. What that means is that any flow coming out from the bottom has to be the same as the flow coming in, and any flow coming in from the bottom goes out the top. In this way, we can represent and solve for an infinite array of these blocks. This is an example of linear periodicity. You can do a similar thing rotationally. There are other specialized boundary conditions that I won't talk about here. Step three is to specify fluid properties, density, viscosity, etc. Step four is to specify numerical options and solution options. For example, how to discretize the equations. When we're solving a CFD problem, we solve for the flow equations in each cell separately. For each cell, we have to satisfy conservation of mass and the Navier-Stokes equations, taking this little cell as a control volume. You do that with all the cells, being careful how flow passes from one cell to another. The actual equations are discretized forms of the differential equations. Step five is to specify initial conditions or initial guesses for each variable in each cell. In other words, u, v, w, and p. And depending on the algorithms, these are typically set at the center of each cell. Step six is to solve the discretized equations. This typically involves iteration. For this little example, we might specify all the velocity components to be zero and the pressure to be constant. But when we apply our boundary conditions, like a velocity inlet and perhaps a pressure outlet, all four of these variables will change everywhere in the flow, but we keep updating our guesses until we converge on a solution. Our goal is to get convergence, which means that the equations are satisfied at every cell to within some tolerance. Here I define something called a residual. You can think of a residual as the error associated with an equation. There's a residual for each cell and each equation. As a simple example, let's take continuity. Here's the differential equation form. Suppose you're doing a very simple-minded discretization that just sets these as delta u over delta x, delta v over delta y, and delta w over delta z. We want this to be zero, but it won't be. It'll be some value r, which is the residual. As we iterate, residual r hopefully decreases if the horizontal axis on this plot is number of iterations and residual at a cell is plotted on the vertical axis, we typically start at some high value and then hopefully level off. In this plot, this is our conservation of mass residual. You'll have similar residual behavior for the other residuals. For example, the three components of momentum. If these residuals don't decay, then your solution is not converging. If the residuals go up, you could have a case where the whole thing blows up. In that case, you'd have to go back to step four and change some of your numerical options or the solution options. Or you may have some problems with your grid or your boundary conditions that need to be fixed before you can get a good solution. Step seven is to perform post-processing, like streamlines or contour plots. For our example of flow over a block, your streamlines might look something like this. And I'll show you some real examples in a minute. Step eight is to calculate global properties. For example, drag force FD on the block. This would be done by integrating all the pressures and viscous forces on this part of the domain, which represents our block. If this were a symmetry plane at the bottom, you'd have to remember to multiply by two. The actual drag force on the block is twice what was calculated by the CFD. Although this has been a rather simplistic introduction, it shows you the basics of CFD and the procedure for how to solve fluid flow problems using CFD. Next, I'll show some actual example problems. These are pictures from my book for problems that I solved using CFD. Here's an example of steady 2D flow over a cylinder. We're plotting tangential velocity contours, u theta. And in this problem, we were determining the separation point at some angle alpha. If we do this same problem, with unsteady flow, 
we find that the actual flow is not steady, but rather oscillates with what's called a Kármán vortex street. Here's an experiment using die streak lines that shows a very similar flow field. Here we're plotting vorticity contours. Vorticity is positive in this vortex and negative in this vortex. The white regions are outside the contour map. In other words, here too high and here too low to be assigned a color. This flow is near to my heart since I did my PhD thesis on circular cylinder wakes. As another example, let's look at steady two-dimensional flow over a stator blade in a periodic array representing an axial flow fan. Here we plot streamlines. Here we plot vorticity contours. Later on when we talk about boundary layers, we'll learn that vorticity is non-zero within a boundary layer and within a wake. Outside the boundary layer, this green area shows that the vorticity is nearly zero. If we do this same problem in three dimensions, we can get pressure contours on the blades and the hub of this stator. The rotor blades would be downstream of these stator blades for this axial flow fan with the flow from left to right. You can see that the pressure on the underside of the blade is large using this scale, and on the top surface it's small. In turbo machinery we call this the pressure surface and the suction surface. Overall pressure along the hub is decreasing in the flow direction. We can also add heat transfer to our flow equations. This would involve adding an energy equation. The energy equation would also have its own residuals. Here's an example of flow over an array of cylinders in a heat exchanger. This is a 2D analysis where these cylinders are infinitely long into the page. They're heated and these are temperature contours showing the individual wakes of these cylinders and how the temperature of the fluid increases because of these heated cylinders and overall the temperature increases as we go downstream. This is a 2D case. I also did a three-dimensional case for a very practical example. I wanted to compare heat transfer for these circuit boards that have the same eight chips on a circuit board, the same flow rate, etc. But these are aligned with the long end in the direction of the flow and these with the short end in the direction of the flow. Each chip was giving off a certain amount of heat and the goal was to see which of these configurations gives the smallest maximum temperature. Here's how I set up the problem with all the boundary conditions. Velocity inlet, walls, and pressure outlet. And each chip had an internal source of heat or energy supplied. Here's the results for the long configuration. The maximum temperature was at this point and was about 461 K. For the short configuration, the maximum temperature occurred at these two points and was 455 K. So this short configuration is the better choice if your goal is to keep the temperature as low as possible on the chip. I also did some steady 2D compressible flow problems. This is flow through a converging diverging nozzle near the throat and there's a shock. The flow here is supersonic and here it's subsonic after the shock. In the top image friction on the walls was not included and you could see that the flow is nice and clean. On the bottom picture we included friction and you can see boundary layers forming which disrupts the shock shape and location. There's even some flow separation here that changes the whole pressure distribution downstream of the shock. Here we calculate 2D supersonic flow over wedges. We get what are called oblique shocks, which is a shock wave that's aligned at some angle. Here we call it angle beta. The wedge angle here is 10 degrees, 20 degrees, and 30 degrees. The approaching Mach number is the same in all three cases. For the first three cases we get oblique shocks but angle beta increases as the wedge angle increases. Beyond a certain angle, such as here at 30 degrees, the shock is no longer attached to the nose, but rather moves forward and forms what we call a bow shock. You can solve all kinds of flow problems with CFD, but you have to be careful that you do it right. The problem with CFD is that you always get these pretty colorful pictures. But if you don't have the right boundary conditions or the right numerics, or a fine enough grid, you can get bad answers. For this reason, some people call CFD colorful fluid dynamics because of all the colorful pictures, but it takes much practice and experience to get good results and to know when your results are good and when they're not. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.